Hello, and welcome to the awesome classical mechanics, also known as Physics 411. This is a graded course that most of you have to take, but I'm going to try and do my best to make it super exciting so you actually don't feel like you have to take it, that you will actually want to take this course. Haha. <laughs> Alright, so let me first get out of the preliminaries out of the way. What is the go going to be the structure of this course? Okay, before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Sasha Chekhovskoy, and I'm going to be your instructor for this course. And uh, you can always reach me at this email address. The teaching assistant for this course is the awesome Jeremy Rath, whose email is very easy to remember. Just add the 2020 and uh, you've gotten his email. So if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to reach out to either of us. So what is going to be the assessment of the course? Well, for that, we have, we don't grade on the curve, uh, you are going to have the numerical grade converted into the letter grade very deterministically. So you will be able at any point in the course um, to follow uh, how well you're doing. And if you have any questions at all, as usual, please feel free to reach out to me. So the percent grade gets mapped in the following way. 9200% maps into A minus A. 80 to 90% gets mapped into B minus B, B plus. And if you get less than 70, which I hope won't happen, um, then you're going to get a D or an F. If you feel like you're not performing to your goals, uh, please reach out to me earlier rather than later. So what do the final grades consist of? So the breakdown here uh, is as follows. Participation credit gives you up to 10% uh, of the percent grade. Uh, this actually is going to be a very important part because most of you will do just fine. And so those 10% uh, might be the difference uh, between uh, maybe a B and an A. Uh, so take that seriously. Uh, problem sets count uh, for 30% of your grade. Uh, Midterm uh, amounts to 30 just as uh, the final exam. Um, so, a few words about the problem sets. Problem sets are hard. So, in order to make the most out of them, I strongly recommend that you uh, join a group of students and work together. So, work in groups. But, write up on your own. So once you figure out the solution as part of the group, which is totally fine, and in fact I encourage that, please then, once you've understood the solution, write it up in your own words with your own thoughts. If you don't understand something, go back to the group, discuss this, but then express your understanding uh, in your own words uh, with your own hand, uh, or if you like, you can type up the solutions. In fact, uh, let me briefly discuss the submissions while we are at this topic. Uh, please do submissions for all of the problem sets, midterm, final exams, electronically. via Canvas. 
please upload single PDF. And please make sure, make sure that this PDF is legible. So please make sure that you use your best handwriting if you write it. Um, and uh, if you write it on paper and then take photographs, then uh, please uh, use a scanner app on your smartphone to ensure high contrast. So actually, uh, myself and Jeremy can actually see what you wrote and give you proper credit. What else did I not mention? Let's see. Yes, of course. Uh, the midterms uh, and uh, uh, the finals. So for both of these, uh, they will be take home. So no pressure. Uh, you can take as long as you want. No time limit. Of course, there is a due date and time, but uh, you will have a week uh, to work on them on your own leisure. Um, you can use any resources, uh, be it a book or online. So it's an open book exam or midterm, but please work on your own. So you cannot talk to either your classmates or to anyone else. You cannot post questions to the discussion boards. But if you find an answer on the discussion board, sure. Uh, you're welcome to use that. Um, uh, kudos to your Google skills. Uh, so the structure of the course uh, will be, in addition to midterms, problem sets, and the final, uh, will involve two components. Uh, component number one uh, will be asynchronous. Uh, so what does it mean? You're going to watch lecture videos online just like you're doing right now but there is also a very very important component you will also need to uh, complete quizzes that follow the lecture videos and uh, if you do so before office hours, then you are going to get participation credit. If you submit quizzes after the corresponding office hours have started, then you're going to get 50% participation credit. So you still are going to get credit, but you're going to get half as much as if you were to complete them on time. Uh, watch these lectures uh, before we discuss the material during the office hours to maximize uh, the effectiveness of the office hours so that all of us are on the same page. So if you have any questions at all about the course structure or uh, about problem sets uh, throughout the course, uh, please, you know how to find us, uh, reach us over email, or you can also post questions in Canvas discussions. In fact, you can discuss problem sets um, or lectures with lecture material with your fellow students right there in Canvas so that if you have a question I will be able to respond to that or Jeremy will be able to respond to that or maybe other students will be able to respond to that if they get there before uh, him or I uh, and then everybody else will not have to worry about answering the same question because you've already asked it. Uh, thank you very much for watching this very first brand new video and I'm going to see you um, at the next video segments of this lecture number one, Classical Mechanics. Yes, let me put here lecture number 1.1. 
Hello, and welcome to part two of lecture one on classical mechanics. 1.2. Um, let me start off uh, with uh, what sort of uh, books we're going to be using. Um, so, we're going to be going after primarily Goldstein classical mechanics. There are other books, like Landau and Lifshitz, that I recommend on the course website. Please go to Canvas and check it out. There is a treasure trove of information, including detailed class and lecture schedule. So if you go there, strongly recommend check out syllabus on Canvas. Well, with these formalities out of the way, let's get to it. So, what will be the first question we're going to try and address? Well, what is classical mechanics? What? Specifically, what is the classical here for? Uh, what typically we mean by that is any physics uh, that doesn't have h-bar uh, and doesn't have a general or a special relative. So what we're going to be working with is the classical mechanics. So what is that? Well, typically when we start deriving mechanics, uh, we do so from the Newton's um, second law, F is equal to MA. And why do we want to study classical mechanics? That is because it is an excellent preparation for, for quantum mechanics uh, or for general relativity, which has a special place in my heart. Why is that? Well, because I do GR, and more specifically, I work on black holes and how they explode their surroundings. So if you have an interest in that, always feel free to stop by virtually and uh, ask me questions over email or Canvas. So there is a lot of cool physics that we can uh, study uh, in classical mechanics, such as expansion of the universe, galaxy formation, black holes, and all sorts of explosions that are associated with those, planet formation, and almost anything around you. For instance, I had to use a lot of classical mechanics uh, when I was designing these li this light board because I needed to make sure it was stable, wouldn't topple over and wouldn't vibrate. So all of those things uh, I had to take care of. Um, what will be our approach in this course to doing classical mechanics? Well, uh, this approach typically involves combination of uh, Newton's second law and uh, Newton's third law. That's the standard approach. Here, however, we're going to go uh, with a different one. Uh, we're going to be using the relationship between conservation laws and uh, symmetries. So we're going to identify symmetries in the problem and then show that they correspond to conservation laws and then these conservation laws 
are going to give us the equations of motion that we will be able to solve. Again, a friendly reminder. Check out the syllabus uh, for information on what's coming up in the course uh, and on when the first problem sets will be due. First problem set due in two weeks. Get it on Canvas. If you have any difficulty getting the problem set, please come and talk to me. That's it for part two of lecture one, and I'm going to see you in part three of lecture one right after uh, you're done with a quick quiz. Ah, hello! Long time no see. And now we are up to part three of our lecture number one, and we're going to be talking about conservation laws. So the, what is the first conservation law that comes to mind? Well, let us start with conservation of linear momentum. How do we get at the conservation of linear momentum? Well, let's start from Newton's second law. That states that F is equal to mass times acceleration. We can rewrite uh, this as the time derivative of the linear momentum. Here, we have in mind a very simple system. A test particle moving at some velocity v under uh, the action of the force f. Perhaps uh, you can think of a system of a planet moving around a star uh, and the two interact gravitationally so the star applies force f on the planet of mass m. Here Momentum is given by, given by P is equal to M times V. So what do we get from this? Is that if there are no forces, then the momentum is conserved because it's not going to be changing in time. What we've derived here is Newton's first law. Which is awesome! What else can we consider the conservation of? Well, we start with linear momentum. How about angular momentum. Considering exactly the same system of a test particle of mass m moving at velocity v, uh, you know, under the action of force f, or you can think of it as a planet uh, orbiting around uh, a, uh, a star, how can we derive the conservation of angular momentum? Well, force changes linear momentum. What changes the angular momentum. Well, uh, that is a torque. So if we write out torque N is equal to lever arm R cross the force F, then we can plug in force F all the way from here to here, and we're going to end up with R cross dp dt. Let's try and form a full derivative over here. It will be d dt of r cross p. Why do we want that? Because this r cross p is uh, the angular momentum. But this is not the full story, right? Because here, however, 
we've added two terms, not just this one, but another one. Uh, let's see how that works. We can uh, write this out as dr dt cross p plus r cross dp dt. And you see that r cross dp dt is the term that we start with, so this term is good. But this is an extra term that we actually need to subtract to be able to get this to be the right identity. So we're going to have to subtract this term minus dr dt cross p. But this term turns out to be special because uh, we can rewrite this term as V, which is dpdt, cross mv, which is the momentum. And as you can see, uh, v cross v will be equal to zero. Therefore, this term vanishes, and all we're left with is n equal to d l dt which means that if the external torque acting on our particle vanishes uh, then what? well then the angular momentum will be constant or conserved. So we have derived the conservation of angular momentum. Hello everyone, welcome to part four of our awesome lecture one in classical mechanics. Now it's time to talk about energy conservation. How can we go about deriving energy conservation? Well, similar to what we've done in deriving the angular momentum conservation, we can take Newton's second law, and uh, dot something into it. But what would that quantity be? Well, let's think. Energy has to do with work. If we do work on a system, uh, it can increase its energy. Therefore, let's try and see what is the amount of work produced by a force. It's given by the dot product of the force times the displacement. So, if we were to divide both sides by the elapsed time, on the left we're going to get the power of the force, no pun intended, and on the right we're going to get the dot product of f and velocity. So dotting this equation into v sounds like potentially a good strategy uh, for addressing uh, the energy conservation. So let's try to do exactly that. v dot f. What happens if we plug this uh, into the energy conservation? Uh, well, let's expand this out. Here I rewrote the acceleration as dv dt. Um, and then now what we can see 
is we're getting m v dv dt, which is a full derivative of v squared over 2. Okay, that's progress. So we see that uh, if we were to integrate this equation on the left, we would integrate the power of the force, uh, which would give us the total work if we integrate it over time. Because power is uh, work per unit time integrated up, we get the amount of work that the force has performed. And on the right, uh, we're going to get the change in kinetic energy because uh, mass of the particle doesn't change. And so we get a full derivative here that is trivial to integrate. Uh, hmm. So that's interesting. Um, in what case can we integrate the left-hand side part of this equation? Well, let's make an assumption that this left part is also full derivative. Let us assume that v dot f is equal to a full time derivative of some function which as we will see will give us the potential energy uh, well this is uh, the potential uh, of the force F uh, but what this allows us to do right now is to integrate this equation because on the right hand side uh, we get a full time derivative and so we do on the left hand side now with this assumption uh, here what is important uh, is that uh, the time dependence comes here only through coordinates so uh, uh, no explicit dependence uh, on time that is dv dt partial derivative is equal to zero so let's go ahead and try and see how can the time derivative of something that doesn't explicitly depend on time uh, be non-zero? Well, as I mentioned, this works through the dependence of coordinates in time. So if our particle moves around, then r will change, and the values of v are going to change as well at the position given by r. So let's use the chain rule to try and compute the value of this derivative. Um, so we will sum over all the three different coordinates that the r is made of. So we will have dv dri, which corresponds to dv dx, uh, for instance, times dx, uh, or in this case, it should be dri. It's pretty hard to cleanly erase on this whiteboard. So it will be dri dt. Uh, so this uh, is uh, a gradient, components of gradient of v, and this is components of velocity. So what we've gotten here uh, is the dot product of velocity and the uh, gradient of v. And I think I missed the minus sign, so I will reconstitute the minus sign on both sides. Just to be clear here, uh, the summation uh, over i equal to x, y, and see the three uh, spatial coordinates. Uh, great, so because this works for any v, right, that means that our assumption that f dot v is a t full time derivative of some function, uh, that is equivalent to f being a gradient of v. So if we, uh, if we now use this equation uh, in conjunction with that one, so if we use these two equations, uh, then we can integrate the system and uh, uh, 
we get the following. So this is a full derivative of the kinetic energy d dt of m v squared over 2. Uh, this is a full derivative of uh, the potential energy uh, plus d dt of v of r and uh, they too, two of them add up to zero which means that uh, the total energy which is the sum of kinetic energy so this is kinetic and uh, this is potential energy So the sum of both of them results in the total energy constant or conserved. And uh, this one is the total energy. So what we have just now done, we have derived the total energy conservation. And that is true if F is a potential force. So it's given by a gradient of uh, V. As we said before, in this case, V does not depend on time explicitly uh, or equivalently uh, dV dt partial is equal to zero. Welcome to section 1.5 uh, of our lecture 1. What we're going to do now is going to try and uh, view some of the things that we have uh, learned in practice. Uh, for instance, let us consider a, an example. The particle on uh, a spring. So here we have the wall, the spring, and the particle of mass m is attached to the wall. Uh, the spring constant is k. What are the conserved quantities uh, for uh, the system? Well, let's ask is momentum conserved? Well, is P of X a constant? Uh, no, because there is a force which is given to minus Kx, therefore the force acting on our particle is non-zero, uh, therefore this is not conserved. Uh, what about the angular momentum? Well, in this case, R cross F is equal to zero because R is parallel to the force. Uh, therefore, yes, uh, the angular momentum is conserved. And what about the energy? Well, in this case, our force, which is equal to minus k times x, uh, can be written uh, in the form of a gradient of v, where v is equal to kx squared over 2. That's the potential energy of a spring. So in this case, Yes, 
our system is potential and therefore energy is uh, conserved. Let us take uh, another example. So that was example number one. Let's take a look at uh, example two. Let us consider a star of mass m that has been orbited by a planet of uh, little mass m. And there is a force f that's acting um, on with little mass m where the force is equal to minus r hat uh, where r is in the direction of the planet times g the mass of the star times little mass of the planet divided by r squared the distance uh, to the planet so what about the linear momentum is it conserved no because the force is not equal to zero therefore the momentum is not conserved what about the angular momentum well uh, the torque equal to r cross f is zero here because r cross f is going to vanish because r is parallel to r hat therefore the angular momentum is conserved what about the energy of the system well let's try and see can we write out this force as a, a spatial gradient of a time independent uh, function of only coordinates well in fact you can do this where v the potential function is uh, given as minus g m m over r uh, as you can verify therefore uh, the energy in the system is conserved and the energy here total energy uh, is given by uh, T plus V and that is given by M V squared over 2 minus G M M over R Hello and uh, welcome to the final part of our lecture 1 part 6 Now we're going to generalize what we have been discussing from one particle to multiple particles. Many particles. What does this involve? What does this involve? Well, until now, one particle, well, from now, we are going to consider many particles. How are we going to do that? And uh, what kind of example um, can I give you in order to convince you that this is important? Well, let's consider the case of uh, the Sun and the Earth system. So the Earth is orbiting the Sun and uh, the mass of the Sun is 2 times 33 grams. That is around 10 to the 57 particles. For the Earth, uh, the mass is uh, roughly 610 to the 27 grams. And uh, that translates into 
10 to the 51 particles. So when you consider two systems consisting of uh, 10 to the 51, 10 to the 57 particles that interact with each other, it's crazy to try and solve equations of motion for each of these particles, the individual interactions through gravitational forces. Uh, we're not going to go and get too far from here. Um, but let's try and see if maybe these internal interactions inside the Sun and the Earth cancel out. And we can maybe write out equations for, you know, the Sun and the Earth interacting as a whole. Uh, so, let's try it out. Uh, let's write out uh, for a single particle. What kind of equations are we going to get? Well, for a single particle, we can uh, write out that its rate of change of momentum is going to be equal to the force that acts on that particle. And that force can be decomposed into an external and an internal contribution. So um, this internal force will actually have a sum over particles j that act on our particle i. So all of these forces are internal. So let's write it out. So this is external and these are internal forces. Uh, so what will happen for all particles? So let's try and sum up. So what we're going to have is we're going to have ddt of the sum. We can write the sum over here and take the sum under the derivative. The sum of all the momenta, so this will be actually a d p total dt, and this will be equal to the sum of all the forces, so it will be the sum of all of the external forces plus the sum over i of the sum over j of all of the internal forces. And because fji is equal to minus fij by third law, we can say that this term actually vanishes and we do not have to include it. It drops out. So if F external, if the total F external total, if F external total is zero, so if the total force externally in our system, the sum of all of the external forces, then the total momentum, then total momentum of the system is constant or conserved. If, however, the total external force is not zero, then can treat Earth as as point particle of mass m 
uh, Earth equal to the sum of all the masses. Um, position RCM or the radius of its center of mass which is the sum over all the particles of MI RI divided by the total mass of uh, the earth uh, and then P total given by uh, the sum over I of MI VI will be equal to the total mass of the Earth times uh, the sum of M I V I divided by the mass of the Earth and uh, this is going to be the time derivative of the radius of the center of mass. So if F external is non-zero then the Earth behaves as a single point particle.